Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is consideration of business motion 13093 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. I would ask that any member who wishes to speak against the motion press the request to speak button now, please. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 13093. Minister. Moved. Many thanks. No member has asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, I will now put the question to the Chamber. And the question is that motion number 13093, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 13088, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a stage one timetable for the Alcohol Licensing Public Health and Criminal Justice Scotland Bill. Could I ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to please press the request to speak button now? And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion. Moved. Many thanks. No member has asked to speak against the motion, and therefore I will now put the question to the Chamber. And the question is that motion number 13088, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 13089 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a stage two timetable for the Prisoners Control of Release Scotland Bill. Could I ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press the request to speak button now and I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion. Moved. Many thanks. No member has asked to speak against the motion and therefore I will now put the question to the Chamber. And the question is that motion number 13089, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. The motion is therefore agreed to. And the next item of business is consideration of two Parliamentary Bureau motions. And I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 13090 on approval of an SSI. And motion number 13091 on committee membership. Minister. Moved on block. Many thanks. The question on these motions will be put at decision time. And it is now time to move on to our next item of business, which is a member's business debate on motion number 12950 in the name of Alec Crowley on thousands of migrants dying attempting to reach Europe each year. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. And I'd be grateful if those members who wish to speak in the debate could press the request to speak buttons now. But I do advise the Chamber we are incredibly tight for time during this debate. I call on Alec Riley to open the debate. Maximum seven minutes, please, Mr Riley. Presiding officer, in moving this debate today, can I first thank all those members of this Parliament who signed my motion and made the debate possible. Members will have received a copy of the publication from Amnesty International Colin called Europe's Sinking Shame, the Failure to Save Refugees and Migrants at Sea. This sets out the sheer scale of the human disaster taking place in the Mediterranean that has seen over 1,750 men, women and children perish at sea in the first four months of this year. Everyone I've met and who I know has been shocked at the scale of the loss of life in the Mediterranean amongst men, women and children. Back in October last year, the Italian ambassador to the UK came to this parliament and addressed the European and External Relations Committee. He spoke of the human tragedy in the Mediterranean and said, we wish there was a clearer plan. To be honest with you, the truth is that we have been left quite alone to face this tragedy. He talked of migrants drowning by the thousand in the Mediterranean Sea. And he said it was not possible for just one country with the occasional help of Malta or Greece to cope with such a major crisis. He added that Italy was pressing other partners to make this issue a European priority and he stated that all political pressure is welcome to create an awareness of the scale of the human tragedy taking place. So today I bring forward this motion, yes, to raise awareness of this tragedy, but also to make the case that this Parliament must do more to speak out and to use every bit of influence we can have to make the UK Government and governments across Europe step up and do what is necessary to stop this tragedy continuing. 
The vast majority of people at risk are men, women and children travelling to Europe from the poorest countries of Africa where poverty is endemic and where opportunity is limited. And there are many seeking protection and asylum who come from trouble spots like Syria, from which there is currently no legal and safe way to get to Europe. And they need our help. We cannot say we do not know for Fortrex, the European Border Protection Agency in Warsaw, in Europe, follows every single boat filled with refugees. And in the last year and a half, we have been using drones and satellites to survey the borders. So European authorities have surveillance of people drowning and down in the Mediterranean. We know people are dying. I want to quote from Pope Francis, who on the 19th of April, after a further 600 men, women and children died, he said, They are men and women like us, our brothers seeking a better life, starving, persecuted, wounded, exploited victims of war. They are looking for a better life. Faced with such tragedy, I express my most heartfelt pain and promise to remember the victims and their families in prayer. I make a heartfelt appeal to the international community to react decisively and quickly to see to it that such tragedies are not repeated. He added, it is evident that the proportions of this phenomenon demand much greater involvement. We must not tire in our attempts to solicit a more extensive response at the European and international level. And that is our purpose, I believe, in being here today. Our country, Scotland, has a proud history of internationalism, of reaching out and of not looking the other way when fellow human beings, no matter their nationality, no matter their colour or religion, and no matter their wealth or social, social status, are in danger. We have to think of protecting people, not just protecting borders. Think about saving lives, not just saving money. I believe we must consider, for genuine refugees, legal ways of reaching Europe. As the United Nations Refugee Agency, human rights organisations like Germany's Pro Asylum and Human Rights Watch have suggested the European Union should create asylum procedures at the embassies of its member states in the same way as Switzerland has done. The Italian Navy's Operation Mare Nostrum rescue mission, which protected hundreds of thousands of refugees from drowning, needs the funds to be fully up and running once again. The European Union also needs to finally begin participating seriously in the United Nations Refugee Agency resettlement programme. The United Nations is currently seeking guest countries for several hundred thousand refugees who need to be resettled. In 2013, North America took more than 9,000, but in Germany they only accepted 300. We must all do more. The EU's Dublin regulation, which allows refugees to apply for asylum in their country of arrival, is an issue. And in Chrysler, crisis-torn countries, we should also look at whether the visa requirement for people from these conflict countries should be lifted on a temporary basis. I do not say that these changes would stop all the loss of life at sea, but they could be significantly reduced, and we should send out a message that just as when Europe too once had its own refugees fleeing Europe and needed the help of the international community, we Europeans in the international community are prepared to help now. I move this motion today, presiding officer, and ask that we all remain focused on achieving action from our UK government and from governments across Europe, because we cannot allow this situation to continue. Thank you. Many thanks. As already indicated, we're very tight for time. Maximum four minute speeches. Kenny McCaskill to be followed by Patricia Ferguson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think Alec Rowley deserves enormous credit for bringing this uh, debate. It is a crisis of humanity. It should and it does unite the entire chamber. And I agree, not just with the tenor, but his uh, thoughts as he has narrated them. Uh, this is a catastrophe, uh, biblical in its proportions, the exodus and the calamity being faced by individuals 
is something that we've probably not seen in the European continent for many generations and if not since World War II. But it doesn't matter whether they are black or white, whether they're Christian or Muslim, whether they're asylum or they're immigrant. Uh, people are drowning and people are dying, as Alec Rowley correctly said. Men, women and children. Uh, common humanity dictates that we need to act and indeed that we need to act now. Immediate action is needed. Uh, some is already underway and some is welcome. I did even see a tweet recently that the Irish Navy have dispatched a vessel uh, to go and assist. To be fair to the Government of Ireland, they have never been uh, shy or slow in standing up for what is right, whether in the United Nations or elsewhere, and that is welcome. Equally, other nations, and especially wealthy nations within the EU and wider, have to do more to take their responsibility. EU and NATO ships are currently located, their warships, in many, uh, many squadrons off the Horn of Africa. It's rightly so, because there's a challenge with piracy, uh, with uh, ships being uh, taken by those who would uh, hold them to ransom, and indeed individuals being held, kidnapped, and indeed uh, not released, and sadly sometimes slaughtered. But if we can do and take action for commercial shipping, then surely we can do more and much more about common humanity. The two are not either or, they're equally essential. But there is another underlying issue relating to asylum and immigration. But this is not an issue of immigration that requires to be faced by all parties and all governments. This is an issue fundamentally of asylum. According to Human Rights Watch, over 50% of those fleeing are actually coming from Syria and Eritrea. What's driving them is not simply a desire for a better world in the West that many see, but it's a necessity of getting out of a country that is war-torn, uh, where not just war but famine, pestilence and plague are also affecting their land. That requires to be tackled and that requires to be addressed. So yes, all parties and post-election there will be debates and discussions on immigration, but this is first and foremost a requirement for humanity to act and also, as Alec Rowley correctly said, a requirement to address the necessity that we have in addressing and tackling the needs of individuals for asylum. The Western world has a role to play in some of those countries. The bombs and bullets were probably not manufactured or established or created in Syria or in Eritrea. They were probably sold to them by Western nations many of the Western nations that countries that these individuals seek to get into. So the problems have been created in some small part uh, by those of us who see ourselves as the victim as they seek to come here. So we do require to take action. And the only thing I would say is to take on board and again echo the points made uh, by Alec Rowley. We do require to take immediate action to save life. But we should look across at the United States of America. Steps taken by there to build a fence, to build a way of blocking people at the Rio Grande have not worked and never will. It will not work in Western Europe where it's easier to cross the Mediterranean in many ways than it is to cross the Rio Grande. We require to solve the problem. That means tackling war in places such as Syria and Eritrea. It means making sure that people can stay in their countries safe, healthy and have a future and hope. Thank you very much. Many thanks. I now call Patricia Ferguson to be followed by Jamie McGregor. Presiding officer, can I begin by thanking my colleague and friend Alec Rowley for bringing this debate to Parliament, although in truth it is a debate that I fervently wish wasn't necessary. But necessary it is. Necessary that we use every opportunity we can to highlight the deaths of people desperate enough to pay large amounts of money to smugglers who then take them out to sea in flimsy boats that they know have little chance of making the journey. Necessary that we highlight the problems that make people leave their own countries to seek new lives in Europe. And necessary that we shine a light on the inaction of European governments in providing help and assistance to those at the front line. In 2014, some 3,000 migrants drowned in the Mediterranean, a record. But already in 2015, 1,700 people have perished, which is estimated to be about 17 times higher than the numbers who had died by the end of April last year. That figure is all the more shocking when you consider that over the weekend just past, one weekend, Italian-led efforts rescued 7,000 more people. 
So while the UK was gripped by election fever and the birth of the royal baby, desperate people, 46 of them, were drowning. And another baby was born, another baby girl. Born at sea to Nigerian women rescued from the Mediterranean by the Italian Navy. Those deaths and that birth rate had barely a mention in our news cycle. And that is why it is necessary that we use our voices and our parliament to highlight this issue. So we have to ask why is this happening? And it's happening because life in Syria and Eritrea and Libya and Gambia and Senegal and all the other countries where people are fleeing makes the odds in surviving a hazardous journey in an overcrowded boat seem worth the risk. Now, I've mentioned in previous debates the plight of refugees from Syria and the fact that their near neighbours in Jordan and Turkey have between them accommodated somewhere in the region of three million displaced people. So today I want to look at Eritrea. In recent discussions with organisations in my constituency, I became aware that very large numbers of people from Eritrea were now living in the communities of Maryhill and Springburn. And I was told that many of these are young people who are trying to escape the mandatory conscription that now applies in their country. And this is no ordinary conscription. conscription. This conscription has no limit. You can be conscripted at 20 and still be in the army at 45. Some people pay army officers large sums of money in the hope of being released. Others are told that in return for what are euphemistically called sexual favours, their commanding officer will allow them to go. But release on these terms rarely happens. So is it any wonder that families are smuggling their sons and daughters out of the country at great risk to the young people involved and great risk, sorry, great cost to their families? Presiding officer, the Italian government deserves respect for what it has tried to do, as does its commercial fleet. But it cannot patrol all of the Mediterranean alone. It needs help. And the international community needs to find a way to help to stabilise the countries people are fleeing from and to support good governance there. Now, that must be a long-term goal. But in the meantime, Europe must fund rescue missions in the coastal areas of the Mediterranean. The idea that seems to be current in some governments that by ending support for such rescues, you discourage migrants from making the attempt is not just callous and inhumane, it is also useless, you must as the numbers show no signs of abating. As Alec Rowley says, presiding officer, legal asylum must take the place of this illegal smuggling of people, and together we must make it a European priority. Many thanks. I must ask members to keep to four minutes, please. Jamie McGregor to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I too congratulate Alex Rowley on securing today's debate on this highly distressing and very significant issue, which I readily accept is a major, a major public concern to people across Scotland, including many of my constituents in the Highlands and Islands. Surely all of us in the Chamber have been shocked and horrified at the appalling loss of lives of migrants in the Mediterranean. Indeed, the European Union Council has rightly called the situation a tragedy, and our thoughts goes out to those poor souls who drowned and to their families. Now we know our British government has made a bigger contribution to foreign aid than any other in Europe. But while, while admitting that, the government has also acknowledged that arrangements existing in the Mediterranean since last October have simply been unsuccessful and insufficient and has committed to working with EU partners to improve search and rescue services. The recent EU Council meeting achieved agreement for a number of key measures aimed at preventing further loss of life at sea Specifically, the UK government has announced that HMS Bulwark, three helicopters and two border patrol ships have been sent as part of the EU's extra efforts in operations Triton and Poseidon. I completely agree with the statements made by the UK government that our EU partners, that while of course our sympathies must go out to migrants and their families and friends, our anger and focus must be directed very strongly against the organised criminal gangs who are profiting profiting from this vile people trading and murder. Stopping this trafficking is a huge international challenge which needs a coordinated response. 
and I warmly welcome the fact that the UK government has offered the services of our National Crime Agency and security services to help identify and target the traffickers. And they should try and identify these useless boats liable to be used and take them out of the equation somehow. The other massive international challenge which the UK is working with other member states is on addressing the factors in those countries, particularly Libya, but also others in Africa and elsewhere, which are driving migrants to want to come to Europe. There are no easy answers here, but the UK government is investing in very significant amounts in its aid programme um, in the key source countries. And all countries must do whatever is within their power to support UN-led efforts towards re-establishing government authority in Libya. This must be fundamental. Today's debate is useful in allowing our parliament to express our own and our constituents' sympathies for the migrants who have drowned and to unite in condemning those criminal gangs taking advantage of vulnerable people and profiting from this appalling trade in human beings. And I know that our European and External Relations Committee is also considering whether to undertake some work in relation to EU migration. And if it does, I'm sure today's debate debate will help inform any work we might do on what we can all agree is a huge international challenge. Now, one thing is sure. Italy cannot be expected to cope with this problem on our own. And this is surely an opportunity where the members of the EU can unite in one body, both for humanity and for practical assistance. Step forward, the EU. Show your worth. Mary Nostrum needs funds. And it's time for action, not time for looking the other way. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Patrick Harvey to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I add my thanks and congratulations to Alex Rowley for bringing this important debate. He and other members have used the right language in this debate. We've talked, we've heard about human beings, human beings facing danger. How different is that from the rhetoric that we hear, not only in this country, but in a number of European countries, which pose these people as a threat, as a threat to us? These people are not a threat to us. These are human beings, and we must reach out uh, in a spirit of compassion rather than have a response to this crisis driven by fear, as so many, uh, particularly uh, in uh, this frenetic election period, uh, try to do. Alex Rowley also said that our policy response must place a greater priority on protecting lives than on protecting borders. That is absolutely right. And once again, it is in contrast with so much of the rhetoric in our political debate at the moment. A response which is geared toward protecting lives will, yes, re-establish those search and rescue operations, but will also establish safe routes for people to flee from persecution, conflict, poverty, uh, or other factors. I am not convinced that those I've heard calling for a security-led response, a military response, I am not convinced of their arguments. I've heard calls for boats to be destroyed. I've heard calls for other approaches which are primarily about deterrence, primarily about protecting borders. If we do that, disrupting the unsafe routes of passage, we will only make these human beings more, more vulnerable to the threats and the dangers that they face. We have to place safe routes of passage before them rather than merely disrupt the unsafe routes. I think that's a critical difference. Frontex, the agency, and Triton, the operation, are geared toward deterrence and to protecting borders. Simply putting a search and rescue operation into their remit is not enough. We need to change that remit entirely and place the emphasis on protecting lives, protecting people, as Mr Rowley said, not uh, principally on protecting borders. As we look at the causes, the things which we should label as threats, the causes of people fleeing conflict, poverty, persecution, and already climate change is a driver of migration, it will continue to grow as a more significant driver of migration during this century. It may become a dominant driver 
on migration. We need to take responsibility, as others have said, I think as Kenny McCaskill said, we need to take responsibility for the contribution we have so shamefully made to those problems, to those threats, to the things which do cause fear. And we must recognise that people have a right to seek to migrate, whether through asylum or uh, other forms of migration, because of conflict, because of climate change, because of persecution and poverty. The criminals who exploit them, whether in trafficking, yes, or indeed in exploiting their labour when they reach a country of safety, which very often they won't experience the same degree of safety as we would anticipate in our own lives, they need to be addressed as criminals. But the causes of that conflict, need to, that, of that migration, need to be recognised, and fundamentally the rights of people to flee from these, these causes uh, of human suffering that's what our priority should be. I once again commend Alex Riley for his motion and for his choice of topic in this debate. Many thanks. And I now call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Claire Baker. Um, this is one of these occasions in the hubbub of uh, political debate and disagreement that shows that actually, as politicians, all of us here are more united by issues than we are divided by them because I don't expect to hear a contrarian voice uh, on this subject. Al Jazeera has uh, reported in the last 24 hours that there have been six operations that have rescued 600 migrants. Uh, that's mainly Italy, but has also included what is a very small jurisdiction, uh, Malta, with a population rather similar uh, to that of Edinburgh. So let me join others and congratulate uh, Alec Rowley on bringing this uh, topic forward uh, for debate. It is timely, it's appropriate, and it's necessary. Amnesty, in their briefing, uh, tell us that there are 3.9 million refugees registered in Syria's neighbouring countries and in Egypt. And yet, since 2013, the EU have offered 40,000 places. It barely touched, you would barely notice that anyone had been removed uh, from these uh, 3.9 million. And well done to Germany, who provided 30,000 uh, of these uh, places. The motion that Alec uh, Rowley has put before us uh, focuses on the Mare Nostrum rescue uh, mission, which uh, has been stopped, uh, and its replacement. Um, and Amnesty have provided us with uh, a real graphic illustration uh, of how reduced. We used to have six helicopters, we now have one. We used to be spending 9.5 a million were now spending less than three. And let's give a scale to that. The amount of money that's actually now being spent on trying to help people who are trying to escape from threat, from poverty, from hunger, is less than one-tenth what we spend on supporting the bus pass in Scotland. That's how tiny the amount of money that's actually being spent uh, to support people in their personal extremity is. And what we've seen since the uh, support for uh, what is happening in the Mediterranean has reduced and retreated closer to Italy, meaning that help is much further away from Libya, many times further away, is a huge rise in the number of casualties uh, that uh, arise from this. Um, we're looking at uh, the right kind of things being said. The European Council, Donald Tusk, has said saving lives of innocent people is the number one priority for us. But when you match the words to the deeds, it's not all that obvious that we're going even if I will, Mr Finlay. Neil Finlay. I wonder if Stuart Stevenson agrees with me. If the EU spent as much time and effort on protecting and enhancing the, enhancing the lives of people across the globe as it does protecting its own economic interests, we may be in a much better place and wouldn't see the catastrophes that we're seeing just now. Stuart Stevenson. I, I don't always agree with everything Mr Finlay says, but I think he captures the essence of it extremely well in his uh, intervention there, presiding officer. And let me just, uh, in the strict four minutes that I've been allocated, uh, sum it up uh, as follows. Uh, first of all, the Labour government, 
in 1947 passed an act to support the polls. So we know that there is goodwill on the benches to my left. We've heard from Jamie on the right, uh, goodwill as well. Bottom line is, this must not be a borders issue. This is about common decency and humanity. And I absolutely support every word that Snalik Rowley's uh, motion before us today, presiding officer. Many thanks. I now call Claire Baker to be followed by John Finney. Um, I'd like to thank my colleague Alec Rowley for bringing this important members' debate to the Chamber. Only a few weeks ago, we witnessed highly distressing scenes that dominated the headlines. But as Patricia Ferguson highlighted, the news cycle often moves on. However, the crisis is still very much ongoing, including reports of more rescues and deaths in the Mediterranean at the weekend. And with no long-term solution on the horizon, it is right that we use the time today to highlight what is both a heartbreaking and a complex crisis. Uh, May has only just begun, but we're heading towards 2015 being the deadliest year for many migrants attempting to escape persecution and find a better life in Europe. This must urge us all into action. The solution is far from simple. There are many push and pull factors that need to be addressed, and the next couple of months is crucial. The European Commission is moving towards completion of its agenda for migration, and this must play a vital role in addressing the crisis in the Mediterranean and ensure that our summer months are not filled with more horrific stories of innocent people dying. The decision to cancel Mare Nostrum and operate Triton instead was simply the wrong decision taken for all the wrong reasons. As the decision was being taken to cancel Mare Nostrum, there was clear warnings at the time that the consequences would be fatal. The logic that the scaling back of the rescue operation would result in less people attempting the voyage was clearly flawed. It failed to take into account both the human trafficking aspect of the Mediterranean crisis and also that for many migrants and refugees, the risk of staying in Libya was and remains far greater than the serious risk of trying to cross the sea. If we are to find long-term solutions to this situation, the question we should be asking is not uh, where do these migrants want to go or how do we stop them, but why are they risking their lives and their families' lives and their children's lives to leave family and friends behind? We face new dangers in the world where ideology fails to recognise borders, conflicts are extending beyond countries and quickly spread throughout regions. The vast majority of the boats that attempt to cross the Mediterranean depart from Libya, but almost half of these people on the boats are Syrian or Eritreans. They are attempting, as others have said, to flee war, poverty and persecution. They find themselves in a country that they aren't from and one that they don't want to be in. As these conflicts escalate, countries become unrecognisable even to their own people and the desire and need for many to escape grows. Those who have read the amnesty briefing will be aware of the dangers migrants have to face on these trips. The case studies mentioned are heartbreaking and the details are harrowing. As this debate continues, we must all remember this. That is why we need to ensure we have a full and proper search and rescue mission is, is introduced. One that isn't just about patrolling Italian borders, but is focused on saving the lives of those in jeopardy. In the current circumstances, what we are facing in the Mediterranean is not an issue of border controls, but a humanitarian crisis. If we are to deal with this crisis, then we must look to address the root causes of why men, women and children are willing to risk their lives fleeing to Europe. The problems are complex and so too are the solutions. It will require an understanding of global pressures and acceptance in Europe that although we have a border, we are global citizens with a responsibility to play our part in addressing the world's problems and securing a better future for people around the globe. Many thanks. And I now call John Finney, after whom we will turn to the Minister. Hey, thank you, President Officer. I, I join with others in congratulating Alex Rowley on this hugely important issue. I also thank the um, Amnesty and Save the Children for their briefings and uh, declare my membership of both. Amnesty talk about thousands of people fleeing conflict, persecution and violence trying to reach safety and Kenny McCaskill touched on the issue of conflict and that's been fuelled by the ready availability of armaments, many of which have been designed and uh, manufactured in Scotland and sold from Scotland. So there is a, uh, an, an obligation on us. Uh, persecution, people are fleeing persecution. Uh, and I think the West's attitude to the Arab Spring has sent a very confusing message. Initial support, then we're an indication we're not really bothered about this democracy. It's more about who's in charge and access to resources. And of course, that's resulted in violence and a, a brutal backlash, much of which passes without comment. 
Many of these people are leaving from uh, Libya. Lib Lib Libya is in a state of anarchy. If you check the Foreign and Commonwealth Office advice, the advice is against all travel to Libya. And indeed, they're advising British nationals, to, they're urging them indeed to leave immediately. But clearly, we're urging other people to stay there. We're urging people to stay there despite the shortage, shortage of medical supplies, water and food. And it's a similar situation in Egypt and Tunisia where there's uh, lengthy advice about travel uh, in these areas. We know the Mediterranean route is the most dangerous and lethal in the world. And uh, clearly for those desperate enough to attempt it, it's far more attractive than the alternative, whether that be Syria, Eritrea or increasingly West Africa where conflict is rife. It's entirely wrong to lay the responsibility at the door of Italy, as the motion states, the UK Italian ambassador talked about a common interest managed at common level, and I think that's entirely right. Uh, the decision to end the Mare Nostrum, <coughs> which Italy's humanitarian search and rescue operation was taken in agreement with the EU, and that therefore, to my mind, demands an EU response. Common humanity has been mentioned a number of times, and we know that that operation was replaced by Operation Triton, patrolling borders and smaller craft near shore, further from the North African coast. Previously, the, 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 it was uh, 95 nautical miles off the Libyan coast. And Alex Rowley talks about the uh, technology that knows that means that we are fully aware of the extent of the uh, tragedy that's out there. Um, increasing the reliance is on coast guards and humanity from uh, commercial ships. And I found out in the course of looking into this uh, uh, background for this debate that all shipmasters are bound by an obligation codified in the international law of the sea to render assistance to those in distress at sea, regardless of their nationality, status or the circumstances in which they're found. And what a very sound foundation to look at any future operation the EU might mount, uh, mount. So I think it's important to praise the Italian Coast Guards and the Armed Forces of Malta. Now, many members present will have signed um, Stuart Maxwell's fine motion in respect of Nepal, uh, which talks about the contribution of six firefighters from the Scottish Fire and Rescue Ser Service, working together with uh, uh, colleagues from across the United Kingdom and involved in providing support, which will include medical assistance and search and rescue message, uh, um, missions. Um, that's proactive humanitarian uh, support and it's rightly applauded there was a report yesterday about dozens drowning off the coast of Sicily, and some of you will have seen the footage of an overladen craft, terror in everyone's face, and sitting in the middle, a bewildered toddler girl looking to adults for support. These people are victims, they are not the accused. The UN's High Commissioner for Refugees in Europe said we must step up the capacity to save lives. Triton was a mythical Greek god, and in Virgil's Aeneid, it's told Triton killed Messinus by drowning him. Alex Rowley talks about the need for this parliament to speak out. I think that's what we're doing. And next week, the EU pres uh, present the operational plan. And uh, I think we should call not only for support of an expansion of the search and rescue operation, but hope to see action to address the reasons thousands of people fleeing conflict, persecution and violence to reach safety do so in the first place. Thank you very much. Many thanks. And I now invite Fiona Hislop to respond to the debate. Minister, seven minutes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I want to begin by thanking Alex Riley for tabling this motion. Uh, I'd like to reassure Alex Riley and other members who have spoken here today that the Scottish Government is fully committed to doing whatever we can uh, to help in addressing those ongoing tragedies and the devata devastating loss of human lives. Indeed, we have offered assistance in the last year. This Parliament uh, in the northwest of the EU should stand in solidarity with the Europe of the South and the distressed dying in the Mediterranean. And it's with profound sadness that I note that the situation in the Mediterranean has slipped from recent news headlines. This is despite reports that nearly 6,800 people were rescued in separate incidents over the weekend and more bodies of people who died recovered. One of those rescued was a heavily pregnant woman who gave birth to a daughter on her rescue sh ship. I understand there's been six such births on naval vessels. Whilst reporting of this, these human tragedies may fluctuate, the deaths and mi mi misery continue, and it is vital that we never forget what has happened and continues to happen in the Mediterranean. This debate in the Parliament today helps to keep this issue at the forefront of our minds. The news headlines are not telling a story of a single human humanitarian disaster. They represent only a fraction of thousands of individual human stories of war, climate change, extreme poverty, spanning years and decades. 
This human suffering drives people to take unimaginable risks for themselves and their families in dispute of a safer and better life. The deaths of so many of these vulnerable migrants is an issue that I have persistently raised since 2013. In 2013, the world learned of what was known as the Lampedusa disaster. This was when hundreds of migrants died in a shipwreck off the Italian coast, despite the best efforts of the Italian Coast Guard to rescue as many as possible. And I was in Italy a few days after that disaster, and I heard, I personally heard in the hall, the Italian Prime Minister at the time, Enrico Letta, declare of the hundreds who had died, they are all Italians now. But the horror of that Lampedusa disaster wasn't a single isolated incident. It was just one that made the news. And to migrants, uh, these migrants are not just an issue for the Italians, but for all of us as members of the human race and as humanitarians. Vulnerable migrants and asylum seekers have been desperately fleeing to Europe along the Mediterranean for years. It's estimated over 10,000 people have died in the Mediterranean in recent decades. And after Lampedusa, migrants have continued to search for safety using this route. And now, and most worryingly, it's believed that this summer, these migrant journeys will reach their peak, accompanied by terror, by misery and death, unless as a global and European community we act. And since first raising this issue in 2013, I've continued to raise the need for multilateral action at Joint Ministerial Committee and also in correspondence to the UK Minister of State for Europe and the UK Minister of State for Security and Immigration. And throughout my campaigning on this issue, I've endeavoured to stress that the abandoning by the EU, supported by the UK, of search and rescue was simply wrong. It was wrong in terms of basic human decency and compassion, and it was wrong in practical and pragmatic terms. I am pleased that there has now been an emergency EU summit on this issue, but Europe must address these tragedies in terms of a long-term strategic approach, and many members have stressed that. <coughs> Our strategic action needs to look at where people are fleeing from and why. Many are from Syria and Eritrea, as we've heard. Many are coming from Libya. Men, women and children are dying in the Mediterranean, but this is an issue that is beyond the confines of the Mediterranean Sea, Italy or the EU. And as part of our strategic efforts, we must look at the displacement of millions of people and provide support for the rehabilitation and compassionate treatment of refugees at their countries of origin. If there is no effective rescue operation, this won't stop desperate people fleeing desperate situations and taking even greater risks to reach Europe. And outside of our Scottish Parliament, too much of the media and political debate, in my view, has focused on a criminalised response to human traffickers. But many of these migrants aren't being trafficked. And this focus can be misleading. It obscures the reality of many vulnerable migrants feeling compelled to make these perilous journeys in search of safety for reasons that are so difficult for us here today to ever really understand, many of these migrants have paid for this transportation and are not being trafficked. They, and, and they're paying for transportation that may lead to their death and the death of their children. This situation requires a focus on the vulnerable victims themselves and must be addressed as a humanitarian issue. Humanitarian issues are by their nature cross-border and pan-European. Together, we must prevent the Mediterranean from continuing as a watery grave for so many fleeing conflict, fear and hate. The EU must take collective responsibility. And the agreement of four priority actions at the emergency summit is a start, but it is only a start, and it must not be a temporary political fix. We must stand together, and we mustn't just treat this as a Frontex or simply a borders issue. The Italian government needs long-term support from their EU partners, the UK is not a member of Frontex, as it is not part of the Schengen area. But the UK must play a full part in supporting our Italian friends and colleagues. Italy should not bear the responsibility in tragic misery by themselves. And this cannot be a one-time offer of help when the Mediterranean is in the news headlines. And that is why our debate here in the Scottish Parliament is so important. As parliamentarians, we must encourage parliamentary scrutiny of the issue, not just at the European level, but at the domestic level too. And now is the time for the incoming UK government to approach this issue differently with a humanitarian, strategic and multilateral approach. And I'm sure that would be supported across the chamber. In my correspondence to the UK government last November and again in January 2015, I said that the Scottish government stands ready to help. We have also said to the UK government that we can play our part in whatever cooperation is required on Syrian refugees. We will continue to make those offers. 
But I also know that members across this parliament also stand ready to help in whatever they can and are prepared to support the Scottish and UK governments on this issue. Standing together in solidarity, taking long-term strategic action, we can make a difference and we will continue to do all we can to address this devastating humanitarian crisis. And, Presiding Officer, I undertake to ensure that the new UK Government is fully informed of our debate, our concerns and our commitment to the vulnerable people of the Mediterranean. Thank you. We now move to general questions. Question one, Joanna.